Today, our, moderating, our moderator for this panel will be the fantastic Ms. Maria Exanofontos, who is a fantastic member of the crypto industry. Uh, she's an award-winning CMO, a tech entrepreneur, and international keynote speaker based in Dubai. Joined by Mr. Naeem Aslam, who is a prominent figure in the finance and investment industry, known for his extensive experience, entrepreneurial spirit, and deep expertise in various domains of finance. Joined along with Mr. Rudy Shoshani, he is an award-winning founder of Crypto and DX. Crypto Talks and DX Talks, the digital leaders platform. He's affiliated with the BCC Management Consultancy and is part of the Forbes Technology Council. Joined by Mr. Reese Merrick, who is a senior director of the Global Strategic Partners at Ripple, where he leads relationships with key financial institutions and crypto partners, adopting blockchain-based payments and crypto liquidity solutions to enable cross-border payments. Joined by last but certainly not least, Mr. Sujay Kant, who is the founder and president of Istakapaza Inc., a blockchain-based ecosystem commerce platform that simplifies home mortgage and reduces friction for every participant. Everyone, please put your hands together in a resounding round of applause for this influential panel. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to see you here. I'm very honored to be moderating this panel. Um, as you see, we have very good uh, speakers uh, on this panel, and they will share um, their expertise and their experience. So let's start. Uh, so today we're talking about blockchain in global money transfers. Uh, as we know, the blockchain technology has the potential to disrupt industries such as the traditional financial services. I will start with a question of Rudy. And uh, you can all reply later on. How have you seen blockchain technology evolve in the context of global money transfer since you founded DX Talks. Good morning. So, you know, it's, it's a bumpy ride what's happening in the world of blockchain and crypto, I think. It's up and down, people are afraid, uh, a lot of things has happened, but what we see over the years that it's only going up, it's only getting more adoption and more people are joining. And this is beautiful. So since we started the X Talks, so we're almost now going into our fourth year, which is kind of new, but the whole market is also somehow new. But since 2018 or 2019, and then the age of going into COVID, things has changed. Uh, We've got introduced to a lot of innovation also, which was helped by different protocols or different cryptocurrencies and or innovation environments to help us. Uh, there's a lot of uh, context globally has changed. It's not the same anymore. So things are really moving. And then if you later on, you'll see Ripple, they're trying to really disrupt not just the cryptocurrency market, but also the payments and trying to play a bigger role and then now with the SEC, so we're, we're, we're there, we're moving forward. Um, looking back also at the banks, right? Uh, banks has been, or financial institutions in general, has been kind of reluctant. They don't want to go into the space. Um, they're not happy about what's happening in crypto. Why do you think they're not happy? All of a sudden, all of a sudden they woke up and then now they're pushing ETFs, they're pushing more uh, Bitcoin portfolios. Look at BlackRock, look at JP Morgan, look at Chase Manhattan. <clears throat> because at one point of time, and it took us a while, you know, you, you cannot, especially in banking, a lot of compliance, a lot of procedures, a lot of traditional ways, slower paced, and so many other things. And then add to that the fraud factor, which happened, started in early 2013 or 2012, which was kind of a bad reputation. But in reality, if you look now, the fraud has like kind of winded down a lot because who wants, 
who wants to transact and then get his uh, transaction identified for fraud. So now you can technically be tracked. I would have loved the system to be adopted more, but if I was a fraudster, I wouldn't do it on a blockchain. So we're moving, things has moving a lot. Uh, funny enough, you know, the world of NFTs and what happened with NFTs is not related directly into the payments, but it is related directly into the adoption and then how we were able to get more people involved in this space and then get them uh, starting their journey in the blockchain and the world of crypto. And it's only moving. So day by day, we're only going to get more companies and more regulation and look at Dubai. We're centered in a place where uh, I would say one of the most advanced regulations and look at VARA, uh, what, what, what VARA is doing, trying to push in the end of the day a regulation, a regulatory adoption in a very proper way where you can have your transaction done from the bank directly into crypto or fiat currencies or whatever. So this has moved a lot. You, you know, a few years back, you couldn't see this anywhere in the world. So now it's very interesting. Yeah, thank you so much for the uh, very um, insightful answer. I'm sure most of the projects here and attendees are very interested to this panel because you can have uh, various types of projects, but the way you move money, money around is the most crucial. So it makes me, uh, your answer give me, um, I want to jump on another uh, question where geopolitical tensions are on the rise, how that will impact the crypto space? Nim, this is for you. Thank you. I think that's a great question. Now, when it comes to geopolitics, I think we are talking about the West, we're talking about BRICS, mm -hmm. and everything in between that. Mm -hmm. Now, given the fact what has happened with Russia, Ukraine, and then the whole world is divided in different triangles and in different segments, and even mobilization of some nuclear weapons to an extent, there is a strong need for a common currency. Now, with the recent event that happened for BRICS, the main thing in that particular one is, okay, are we going to see a currency which is going to threaten the status quo for the United States dollar? And where we sit, we think the threats are increasing on a daily basis. Now, will we see BRICS coming up with a cryptocurrency? Absolutely no. Maybe central digital that's not going not to be their option. What, from, the, from, from their perspective, it is going to be a currency which is more likely to be backed by agriculture commodities such as wheat, rice, mm -hmm. plus gold. Mm -hmm. So I think rather than how our central banks in Bank, Bank of England or Federal Reserve Bank where the, the currency isn't actually backed by physically with, with gold or, or with anything, but just the guarantee of the government. These BRICS countries are going to come up with a currency which is going to be backed by traditional methods of using gold and agriculture. Because right now, if we look at the overall geopolitical situation, prices for olive oils, are, uh, olive oil, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but over the last 48 hours, there, there, there has in, in a lot of news flow, which is just saying olive oil prices have gone 100%. Rice prices are also increasing. So I think when it comes to geopolitical tensions, it is about, it's not about fiat. And if it is not about fiat, I think digital currencies like cryptos are going to struggle to gain confidence among consumers. To gain confidence among consumers is going to be okay. Which particular block of countries have a currency which is actually backed by something because under those geopolitical conditions dollar will lose value pound will lose value euro will lose value because they are centrally they're not backed with anything apart from a massive debt on, on the balance sheets but in relation to BRICS and then this is our own personal opinion and our research and base case scenarios that those particular currencies are going to be more valuable which are backed by actually gold 
and soft commodities because at the end of the day consumers will need them consumers will need grains to live consumers and i think gold is going to be a very important element thank you so much uh, this gives me uh, on uh, another question talking about ripple uh, ripple is known for its own cross-border payments how does Ripple's blockchain technology improve the efficiency of these transactions compared to traditional methods? So I think if we look firstly at the traditional methods, um, essentially cross-border payments are running on technology that was built in the 1970s, right? So if you think a cross-border payment can take three to five days to settle in some cases, it's extremely expensive with correspondent banks taking their slice in terms of fees along the way. Um, and also it's, it's pretty inefficient. 6% of global payments actually fail. And this just doesn't serve the needs of the people today, right? So if you think, you know, I can send an email to anyone in this room or my colleague in, in, in Singapore, they're going to receive that within seconds. But when I want to send a global payment to the US, it kind of falls into a black hole where nobody knows where it is. So Ripple believe, and it's always been our focus to focus on cross-border payments, because we believe that crypto and blockchain technology can really have a huge impact there. You know, it can reduce the fees to a fraction of what people are paying at the moment. The efficiency and speed of which a payment can move goes from days to seconds. And ultimately, you have that transparency to know where a payment is along the way. So, you know, Ripple have built a, our, our, yes, our key product is a product called On Demand Liquidity, which essentially uses XRP and the XRP ledger as a bridging asset between two fiat currencies. And what that does is it allows the entities that we work with to move value in real time at a fraction of the cost. Currently moving around 15 billion annually of real value um, with our partners who are payment service providers and corporations. So we've seen a huge amount of growth and a huge amount of benefits to our customers that are now utilizing uh, our product. Thank you, thank you so much. And we're going, Sujay, I have a question for you. Issa Kapansa is involved in blockchain solutions. Could you please share some use cases where blockchain technologies has had a tangible impact on global money transfers? Uh, namaste, guys. Um, in fact, that's a very interesting question. Um, I just saw it actually when I came here. And uh, I flew in straight away from uh, Central America and South America, where we are act working with the farmers on the ground and uh, these farmers supply most of their supplies to uh, McDonald's and uh, Burger Kings. In fact, the sesame that you see on uh, Burger Kings and um, McDonald's comes from Nicaragua. And uh, you know, that's where we are enabling the farmers through our blockchain solutions and that's the best use case. Uh, wherein fa farmers are getting faster payments and obviously much better price. We all speak of farm and fork, but where is the finance in it? Ultimately, the farmer has to get benefited. And uh, through our technology, not only we are moving the money faster, but also making it more transparent to all the ecosystem participants, be it uh, the industries or whoever is consuming, the farmers or anybody else in the chain. I think for me, that's the best use case. Apart from that, uh, the, I mean, uh, I would also address on the point what Naeem said, uh, basically going to the fact that soft commodity based uh, um, whatever currencies or tokens may have value, uh, we are actually working on the same system across uh, the Latin American markets, which is mostly agri-based. And uh, I mean, I can touch on the other topic. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure in the following question, but yeah, I mean, soft commodities based uh, currencies will have a lot of value in the near days. Thank you so much. I want to pass the question to Rudy. And that's an interesting question for to, to know what emerging trends in blockchain technology should individuals and businesses in the financial sector be aware to stay competitive? Thank you for the question. Well, as we mentioned, things are really moving fast. And if you want to continue operating the same way you are, I think we're going to be in a, in a, in a problem 
especially now things are has taken with generative AI uh, another dimension of how we're going to be operating even with data. So what about payments? And Riz, you just mentioned how things are moving. If we look at um, uh, cross-border payment, for example, and what Ripple is doing and others, trying to f play a big or fill the gap and using decentralized finance and trying to create innovation in the space so that they can really uh, innovate. And I love the word innovate, by the way, because it really takes us out of our comfort zone to create something totally new. And this is what we need, the more and more. Uh, if you look at remittances globally, what's happening in remittances, and we know remittances is a big part of the economy all over the place, and especially in UAE. Uh, you need solutions for these, and then how can we partner, how can we create solutions for such... Uh, I've, I've been following a little bit, because we're writing on this a lot of times, and we're trying to get what's, what's happening in the world, uh, especially you know, because on DX Talks, this is what we're trying to see, the latest and greatest. The assets tokenization, was it from physical assets, such as properties and whatever, and then the world of assets tokenization and property tokenization has, is, is really something crazy. And then how money is actually flowing, how are they tokenizing the assets, and then how are they uh, able to sell it in a very fast, efficient way. And now you can talk about even fractional assets, no longer, you know, I want to take shares in property companies or whatever. Uh, it's, it's amazing. So uh, CBDCs is another topic which is hot and banking sector or financial sectors are trying to put their thumbprint inside so that they are not left alone or outside of the, uh, of the game. And that's why I think now I would say 99% of the global uh, central banks are trying to, to see what it is. There's a lot of use cases that already uh, been uh, discussed. UAE is on the forefront. I think there's the best use case documentation published by UAE and KSA called Aber. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. And again, I cannot stop talking about the world of decentralized finance and what's happening in there. Uh, it's a huge economical advantage for all of us where money or cryptocurrencies or financial transfers and instruments are happening in none very fast and new ways where traditional finance or Tradify is not able to cope. As you mentioned, a black hole. Uh, personally, I'm sick of black holes, of not knowing what's the status of anything we, we do. Things take time, bureaucracy, we want regulation again, but we do want it uh, in a faster way. And the agendas are being pushed globally. And guess what? I think we're all here today. We all want a faster way to get something or to transact or to get our uh, property deeds or whatever we want. So there's a lot of things that we are demanding, which is pushing governments to follow, but they are a little bit slower. So we need also on the regulation side uh, to follow. And I think UAE is posi positioned, hopefully, in one of the best places and positioned to play a key role in going in this revolution and disruption. Can, uh, I, can I just yes, add yes. a little bit on that? I think we, we all talk about efficiency, faster payments, and all that solution. But here, here are some interesting facts. If you look at institutions like BlackRock, Fidelity, uh, Numera, all of these ones, doesn't matter, the list is just big. They are all talking about the slowest currency within the cryptocurrency space, i.e. Bitcoin. And the reason for that is there is a lot of faith behind it, which is concerned, I don't know, I'm not expert enough to say it, whether it's a commodity, whether it's a currency, but there is a faith, and that that's the only reason that they're considering it as an alternative asset. But they're not transacting. They're, they're, they're not <laughs> transacting. They're considering it as, a, as an alternative asset. In terms of a geopolitical turmoil, 
it could be considered as an asset which will have some sort of a value. So when a lot of cryptocurrencies come on the, uh, on the market showing that they have a lot of efficiency and everything else, yes, they may or may not do, but I th what we believe is I think the CBDCs would be very much on the forefront of that. And then going back to the earlier topics, it, do you know who's the biggest holder, which country is the biggest holder for the US treasuries? Anyone? For the U.S. Treasuries, China, right? China has been dumping U.S. Treasuries at a record pace for the last three years. Look at the chart on a Bloomberg. It's a record pace. And what is China buying if they are dumping Treasuries? They're buying gold. And China is part of what? BRICS. And it goes back to, the again, the, the main thing. What is the currency for BRICS is going to be backed by what? gold soft commodities and then apart from that what is the other alternative asset in terms of movement of uh, money or a value from one place to another i think it's still bitcoin which represents that thank you so much uh, i want to ask you though what is the current situation of liquidity and i want to pass another question to everyone where do you think the market is moving so we will start with you, please. So in terms of a liquidity, in my own personal fund, I own real estate in the United Kingdom, right? So there are assets which are yielding more than 25% of the rental value, right? And I love to tokenize those ones. These, this is my own personal investments, which includes apartments, hotels, and commercial units. And then we are buying more because in the UK for the property market, because where the interest rates are currently, there's a huge opportunity to gain, to get bargains. Just give you an example. Very recently, a PE fund, private equity fund, bought four different assets in the United Kingdom for 4.1 million, put it on an auction for a 1.1 million yielding 300,000 pounds per annum, which is more than 20% of that. The asset, we thought when they put it on the market, they were just drumming the beats. They were, they were trying to drum them quite as, as loud as possible to get a lot of interest. But guess at what price they were sold at? 1.4 million. That is the market in the United Kingdom right now. So going back to the liquidity situation, I think until and unless the bigger institutions, i.e. BlackRock and every, everyone else comes in, because tokenization of real estate is not real. It's, 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 not, it's not new. REITs were there already, but the ticket size was quite high for REITs for an average investor to get in. That is what the traditional, or the, or, sorry, the, the new uh, cryptocurrencies or real estate tokenization of our projects are trying to do to bring the smaller investors. So I think until bigger institutions come, provide their credibility on the front, we are gonna continue to struggle on the liquidity side for the secondary market, not for the first market. Yeah, I totally agree. When the uh, big institutions come into crypto, things will change. And please, Rudy and uh, the rest of the panelists, uh, where is the market going? Where is the market going? Let's see from the audience, where is the market is going? <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting to, to, to see where it is going and how it is evolving. Every day we wake up with news uh, everything is affecting the cryptocurrencies. Uh, it's, it's a crazy, it's a crazy time to to live in, but it's a beautiful time to follow the the innovation. We we suspect we have everybody. I think is waiting for the Bitcoin halving, right? So um, in, April. <laughs> in April. Yeah. So that's there's a lot of anticipation there for the next, I would say, seven months that are coming. So we're waiting what's going to happen there. We had a small test with uh, Litecoin, uh, nothing happened. Uh, but in general, the adoption, regardless of the Bitcoin status up or down for me, it doesn't matter. It's, a, it's an asset for me. But what's happening in the world of how we are adopting and growing, I would say if I asked a few years back how many of you have Bitcoin, it would have been different versus today. How much the number of transactions you were doing versus today, you know, for myself, it's like I'm 
mostly trying to do not everything. I cannot do everything with crypto, but it became a vehicle where I'm using more and more on our daily. Uh, I get, I receive emails or LinkedIn messages. Uh, you want to pay your HR now in crypto. And then how many of you received this message? Just sh to, sh to see any hands. Repeat, repeat please. Uh, you receive emails now or messages in LinkedIn for HR payment systems, but in crypto. So it is fully automated using crypto. And I'm seeing this more and more being adopted and then f moving forward. So we are not there yet. It's moving as we speak. We're waiting for the big players to come in to pump more ideas, more uh, adoption, more liquidity. Now we're seeing more, uh, what do you call it, from the such as BlackRock and you know JP Morgan, you know a few years back again, who would have said they are playing with us? Now they want part of the game, and then this is getting us involved on day to day. And then once this gives us trust, we'll see more. We want, I think, we want the next generative AI or Chat GPT application in blockchain and crypto, so that we can get more adoption faster and faster. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> Uh, we'll pass to you. Uh, please tell us where do you think the market is moving and how is Ripple contributing to the whole uh, ecosystem? Sure. So Ripple uh, commissioned a report last year which actually showed that 76% of traditional FIs are looking to implement some kind of crypto or blockchain solution in the next three years. Now, I think back, I've been at Ripple five and a half years. Five years ago, we were having a meeting with large banks. If you mention the word crypto, you know, people looked uncomfortable in their seats, you know. You can see yeah. some, you know, are they going to call security, escort us off the, uh, off the premises? But now you fast forward, you know, five years, or f certainly for the last 18 months, those same banks are calling us back in to discuss what their strategy looks like, right? So... Firstly, big I think change. big change. Some, some, you know, we've made some huge strides there, um, but we still got a long way to go to actually have these, you know, traditional FIs implement solutions that their customers can actually adopt. Uh, a lot of it is is still talk, but again, we've made some 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 tremendous uh, progress there. And Ripple have been quite unique in that sense because we view partnerships between traditional FIs as key to the growth and adoption for crypto and blockchain, right? We believe that you know, these institutions, for, to, for mass adoption, you need to educate, you need yeah. regulation, but you also need the big players who have the reach to also support and push that on to you know, the benefits to their consumers. So that's so, a big focus. So you believe uh, that collaboration and partnerships are crucial? 100%, yes. Okay. Yeah, I agree. And if you think about it, you have these big, slow banks that you know want to implement something cool and sexy, but they don't have the infrastructure to do that. Yeah. So the only way for them to do that is to partner with crypto native entities and businesses who can kind of bridge the gap and give them the solution they need without the heavy lift of building it themselves. And that's kind of what we're seeing. Totally. Uh, to Jay? Well, I mean, the most important subject is liquidity. The biggest market today is the home mortgage industry. Uh, about 60% uh, of the US GDP is real estate. We do mortgage-backed securities. In fact, to increase liquidity, what we are saying is we are working with the likes of JPs, Wells, Chases of the world, and trying to bring everyone on the, uh, on the blockchain. You know, what it enables is, typically, I mean, not to, get in, not to get too much into the details, but Typically, a securitization process from the time a loan is pooled, a, I mean, a pool of loans is done, takes three months. So on a blockchain, it takes about three weeks. So this is our biggest use case, and we are one of the only companies that has done origination to securitization on the block. And the way we have done it is, as we all know, we all speak big things, but getting on the ground and rolling your sleeves is completely another thing. You know, we can all talk big here, people will come, listen, clap and go, but who the hell will do it? It is we who have to do it. So we said, okay, I am a lender myself, I operate in 22 states in the US, so I said, let me be the first guy who will go and do it on the block. 
The same thing we are implementing in the UK. We'll be the first lender in UK on the block. Likewise, in uh, Central America and uh, I mean, I would say Latin America in general, because people are very much aware to it and are looking for alternative currencies. But on the same note, if you mention about de-dollarization, the governments will get thrown because their currency actually fell down in 96 and 97 and there was a huge turmoil. So that's a very politically sensitive subject as well. So you have to balance it. So whatever you do, you have to contribute to the socio-economic growth of the current situation. And the only way which I see where mass adaptation can happen is when you put people into the homes. And putting people into homes is by increasing liquidity in the market and we are speaking to hedge funds and we ourselves have got the first digital banking license in, uh, I mean I will not uh, name the country but we ourselves are going to be the first digital bank completely operating uh, in the next three months in uh, Latin America. Amazing. Uh, so we have a uh, few minutes left. Ah, uh, sorry. Would you like to add something? Yeah, just just a few things. And I, I Rudy think as well. Go, going back to your original question, where the markets are going, I'm going to leave you with two thoughts. Is Bitcoin having halving is more important, or is BlackRock ETF getting approval is more important? I think that would very much answer that question. Because for me, it's about BlackRock coming into the space, then Bitcoin's halving itself. The second thing was Sanjay was saying, great, institutions like these, I love to see them to come into the space. From, from my perspective, construction finance cost is 12% currently in the UK, or upward of a, if you don't have an experience. For a normal buyer, the, the price is 6 to 7%. Liquidity is a massive issue because of the getting the mortgages easily three months. Very, very briefly, three weeks is great, but you can only offer a better, if you offer a better rate than the traditional bank, that would be great for, for, for institutions like ourselves. And then I think you could, why? Because you've already reduced the time from three months to three weeks, so you are unlocking the locked element of the liquidity, so through that you should be able to do that. And if you have it, I'd be happy to chat. No, but I think we sit on both sides, right? This is what I keep saying. We all make so much money, we're used to it. So to pass the benefit becomes a tad bit difficult. But then once a person adapts to it, then everybody falls in line. This is the same case. So for us, I'm a typical banker. I've just entered uh, the so-called crypto or the, uh, the blockchain industry since the last three years. But mine was more necessity. I had to see this problem because my loans used to get uh, stuck in the pipeline and not getting sold, I said, why the hell? Then we said like, okay, the process is getting repeated. And that's when we adapted blockchain.